también tengo la relación, pero no, no me hace daño. Pero, es el frío, es paracetamol. Es paracetamol. Pero alguna vez que tuve un problema de dolor de, 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 de dos y cosas así, me mandaron, no me acuerdo que tenía, me mandaron alguna cosa que me bajó la presión, me dio un susto. Sí, sí. Sí, sí, yo estaba así, pero estaba manejando. Me, me tuve que hacer a un lado y me, me repuse y ya. No, no, es que, y, y además ya no te, eh, no, no es, bueno, yo creo que, yo creo que vamos a empezar, porque si no, sí. Okay. 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 Bueno, pues buenas tardes, eh, me da mucho gusto presentar en esta ocasión al doctor Rodolfo Montes, Rudy, que viene de eh, viene ahora del, de Chandra, del, del observatorio de Chandra y del y de Har ubicado en Harvard. Entonces está ahí conjuntamente. Su trabajo ha sido fundamentalmente el trabajo de estudios de rayos X en objetos estelares y de nebulosas planetarias. Ha trabajado, bueno, su su, eh, su, su licenciatura la hizo en la Universidad de Texas, su doctorado en Rochester, en el Tecnológico de Rochester, y ahora está en Harvard, Harvard Chandra. Eh, su trabajo se ha centrado, les, como les decía, en estudios de rayos X alrededor de sistemas estelares, entonces tiene mucho trabajo en nebulosas planetarias, en sistemas binarios cercanos y en... Eh, precursores de, de nebulosas planetarias, estrellas AG, AGB. Y el día de hoy nos va a platicar sobre la emisión de rayos X en nebulosas planetarias. Please, Rudy, please go ahead. Tiene el nombre eh, latino, pero no habla español, habla poquito español, así es que nos va a hablar en inglés. Sí. Lo siento que no puedo... Uh... Yeah. In Spanish, yeah. So I can I cannot I cannot do it, do it in Spanish very well. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, so as Sylvia mentioned, I, I'm visiting from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it's very cold right now. I'm very happy to be here because it's nice and <laughs> nice and sunny and warm. Uh, I'm going to talk today a lot about X-ray emission from planetary nebulae. Um, some of you may be familiar with the topic, I, some of you may not, so I'll give a little bit of a background. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we're doing with X-rays, studying these objects with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. I'll also have a segment in here where I'll talk about the future, so the Lynx Observatory that we're trying to get launched sometime in the 2030s, 2040s. I'll show you some of those, some of the impact that that satellite might have in the future. Uh, and then I'm going to go on and show you so, a lot of pretty images and a lot of uh, information, but stay with me. Feel free to interrupt me throughout my presentation if you have a question. It may be hard to see, so make noise. Okay, uh, so without further ado, just to give you some context, this is, this is what I'm talking about, planetary nebula. These are beautiful objects. Uh, they range in sizes and shapes. Uh, most of these objects here, which were put together by this enthusiast Judy Smith. Um, most of these are planetary nebula, not all of these. There's a couple of objects that snuck in here. This is called Gomez's hamburger. It's a young star. It has a disk um, around that young star. But most of these are nebula. I'll talk about some of these objects, but you may be familiar with some of the more famous ones like the Helix Nebula. This is the Eskimo Nebula here. Um, and then here we have the famous Butterfly Nebula. And we have a lot of other nebula here. Some of these I'll touch on and show you what they look like in x-rays and what they look like in optical wavelengths as well. Uh, so the, the biggest question that we have about these objects is how do they form such a variety of shapes and structures? How do we get these, these really beautiful structures that we see and that we really see the first time in, in good detail with the Hubble telescope? Um, most of this detail is actually revealed by, the, by going into space where 
the atmosphere is not a problem. The atmosphere is not disrupting our view of these objects and, and blurring out features. Same thing we have to do with, with X-rays because the X-rays don't penetrate our atmosphere. So we have to go to space to, to study them and to actually detect them. So just to give you a real quick primer on planetary nebulae, uh, most of you may be familiar with the HR diagram. This is stellar luminosity on this axis and stellar temperature here. Um, what I'm showing here in this solid line is what we call the main sequence, where most stars in the night sky appear to fall. They fall on this main sequence here, the bright stars, bright and hot stars here, cool and faint stars down here. And then right here are the white dwarfs, which are what the end state of a star like our sun will become in billions of years after it's gone through burning all of its hydrogen and helium in its core and then stripping that core off. The stripping of that core starts here during the giant branches. So a star will evolve off the main sequence into a red giant branch where it'll grow in size and it'll start to lose material. And then into an asymptotic giant, giant branch phase, uh, phase once the helium in the core starts to ignite and burn very rapidly and very quickly. As you'll notice these stars get redder when they go on the branches and they get more luminous. And that's because they're larger in size and they're surrounded by circumstellar material. That circumstellar material is eventually going to be shed and it's going to form the planetary nebula that we see and I've shown you in these images. So here's a typical track for a planetary nebula. You'll notice that I had to actually increase the size of the axes here in order to show you that. Typical textbooks will show you this shortened view here and it'll suggest that the stars will evolve through here and then down to the white dwarfs. But they actually do get very hot. So I had to actually increase this scale to 100 kilokelvin to show you how hot these stars get. They do get very hot. Some of the hottest stellar objects that we're aware of. And this is the exposed core of a star like our sun. And so it's a carbon and oxygen mix that's becoming a white dwarf, but it's still very hot on the surface. Uh, here, there is some uncertainty about what's happening in this phase because, as I mentioned, you're losing lots of material here, and that material is forming dust around the star. And as a result, the core becomes obscured, and we can't see what's happening in there exactly. We call this the pre-planetary nebula phase or the post-AGB phase, depending on how close you are to this point or to this point here. Uh, this is a really interesting area of study, and with uh, infrared telescope and submillimeter telescopes, we can actually start to probe that circumstellar material. But the part that I'm going to be focused on is this part here. This is the planetary nebula evolutionary track. This is a typical one I've shown you here. And the stars are increasing in temperature and at steady luminosity and then turning over towards cooler temperatures as they head towards the white dwarf tracks and slightly lower luminosities. So here's a planetary nebula I showed you in the beginning. This is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. It's probably one of my favorite planetary nebulas, and I'm going to tell you why in a, in a moment. Uh, you're probably already thinking about things about this nebula. Uh, but in reality, these tracks are not so simple. <coughs> There's actually a, a range of masses that you can start with and, and, and trajectories that you go through, but they all pretty much go through this range of temperatures and luminosities here. These are for young stars like our sun would probably go through here and they would go through this phase in about 10,000 years. Whereas a more massive star would go through a higher luminosity phase and reach a higher temperature. And they would do that in thousands of years. So here's what Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope sees when it looks at the Cat's Eye Nebula. And the thing I really wanna call your attention to are these faint circular arcs that you see around the nebula. This is actually seen in scattered light, and we're looking at shells of material that were ejected in a more or less spherically symmetric pattern. And as, the, as that material was lost by the star, it formed these shells, and we're seeing a buildup of that material, and it's scattering the optical light into our direction. But then in the middle, you see this wildly asymmetric and highly structured object, this nebula that has just formed inside of this circumstellar mass loss. And so it tells us that at some point in the past, the mass that the star is losing is spherically symmetric, but then something happens, and that's that part that we can't really fully probe yet. Something happens that causes the mass loss to go asymmetrical. 
And you can see there seems to be material that seems to be flung out in preferred directions. There seems to be a spiral-like structure in this object. And inside you see this cocoon within this, this nebulosity. And that's really interesting because it's where we see the x-rays coming from. So I'm going to show you now what we look what we see when we see when we look at this object with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. I'll blink back and forth so you can study those. All right? Here's a composite view. Again, all the X-rays are being confined to this inner cocoon that you see in the optical here. And then you see that the X-rays are tracing that shape out. And so that's telling us about how we, these X-rays form. And we, we had a pretty good idea of how these X-rays form and how these nebula form. And what's happening is that you have this AGB wind that's losing mass, and it may be spherically symmetric, and it may become asymmetric at some point. And then you have a fast wind from that central star in the middle. And that wind is moving faster than that AGB wind, about two, one to two orders of magnitude faster. And so as a result, it's going to catch up to that slower wind. And when it catches up, it collides with that wind and forms a shock. And then a reverse shock heads back towards the star. And so that entire region is shocked. And that's what we're seeing in the x-rays. That's called the hot bubble. Uh, it's the diffuse light component that you see coming from that, from that object. And then you see in the center, you see the star itself is actually emitting x-rays, or something in the vicinity of the star is emitting x-rays, and that's unexpected. So this diffuse x-ray emission is caused by this hot, it's this hot bubble that's predicted by this interacting stellar wind theory that we have, the foreign planetary nebula. Uh, and the plasma temperatures that we predict from this theory are about 10 million degrees. <laughs> but I'll show you shortly that that's not the case. Uh, these compact central sources of X-ray emission, when we measure the temperatures of this, <laughs> just the X-rays coming from the center, we find that it's about 10 to 40 megakelvin, which is way hotter than we could expect. I told you that these central stars get really hot. They get up to 100 kilokelvin, but they don't get to these temperatures. And so it's hard to reconcile this, this hot, compact plasma with the central star itself. Uh, we detect them in about 30 to 40 percent of these of this planetary nebula that we study and we don't really know exactly where they're coming from but i'm going to show you some of the ideas that we have about where they're coming from here's an uh four panels of four nebula that we've studied uh real quick we've been looking at this object <coughs> here but again you see this central cocoon within the nebula and you see it's filled with x-rays same thing here same thing here this is a hallmark that we've noticed that when you have these comp when you have these nebula and they have these nested shells or they have an outer shell and an inner shell that inner shell is more often than not filled with x-rays suggesting again that the formation process is telling us something about how these form uh, so yes uh -huh. these yeah, those are real. They're probably coming from shadowing uh, of clumps of material that's blocking some of the, because remember, we're looking at this in scattered light. So if you have material around that bright light that's in the center, which is the star, um, it'll actually create shadows. Typically, when you see radial stripes coming from an object, you think that it's the, the, the diffraction of the, of the, Thing that's holding the mirrors together, but this is not the case here. <clears throat> but again, you don't see it in all of these objects, but we do see it very clearly here. Uh, so what we did is I put together a large group of, of collaborators from around the world, and we petitioned Chandra to observe a bunch of objects. And so we call this the Chandra Planetary Nebula Survey, or Chan Plans for short. Um, what we're trying to do is, is survey all of the planetary nebula within a certain uh, volume of the local neighborhood. And so I'm showing you here, this is where the sun is, and this is in distance, and kiloparsecs is here, two kiloparsecs is here. We're trying to do everything within 1.5 kiloparsecs that we can. Uh, the symbol sizes in these, in these diagrams are showing you as approximate, the relative size of the nebula. Um, and so you can see that we have some 
and and the relative size of a nebula is proportional to how long it's been how long ago it was formed the larger the nebula the older the nebula is uh, so you can see that we're targeting a sample of these objects uh, within this space trying to get all of them so far we have about 50 percent of them and it for the time being it doesn't seem like we're going to get more and i'll tell you more about that later uh, so here's a distribution of all of the nebula uh, the ones that are filled in black are the ones that we have observed. Uh, these are only the ones that we've observed. So here's their distri distance distribution on the top. Again, kiloparsecs on this axis. And now I'm, I'm showing you the physical radius. So we take the distance and we figure out how many parsecs that nebula is in actual physical size. And that's on this diagram. Um, <clears throat> Now, when we study these, we see various types of emission. I showed you that we have diffuse sources, which is this hot bubble. But then I showed you that we also have the stars themselves that are being detected. Sometimes we see one, sometimes we see the other, sometimes we see both. In the case where we see just the hot bubbles, th those are these objects here. The point, oops, the point sources are shown in blue in this diagram. And then the composite sources, which are these that are both diffuse and compact uh, are shown in purple. And so all together, they look like this. And what I want to draw your attention to is remember, this is a proxy for radiant for age. So young nebula are down here and older nebula are up here. And you can see that when we find these hot bubbles, it's during the early phase of the nebula. <laughs> and when we don't, we stop seeing them as the nebula grow and expand. And we think that's because the, as the nebula expands, that hot plasma decreases in temperature and it also decreases in density. And so we don't detect them anymore. So in the, in the histogram with the size resolution, where is the, the small, the, where are the smaller nebula? These? Yes. They're right here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just project this axis that way and build up a histogram. Same, project this axis upwards to, to build that histogram. Uh, so again, you see, as you get to older nebula, we, we detect fewer and fewer of them. And when we see these point sources, we typically see them in the older nebula. Uh, putting this onto a more familiar diagram, the HR diagram. So here I have log effective temperature of the central star and the luminosity of the central star. Those tracks that I showed you earlier go in this direction here. So the stars are evolving towards higher temperatures at constant luminosity. Then they turn over and they head towards cooler temperatures and lower luminosities. And again, this is the early phase up here. This is the phase where the nebula are young, compact, and, and very the, the, the central stars are, are putting up a lot of photons that are ionizing the nebula. And also this is when we see the shocks in the, in the, in the x-rays, the plasmas. And then we turn over and we start detecting fewer and fewer, and we only see uh, compact sources, point sources, once in a while. Sorry, red points there? Red points? Yes, hot bubbles, I don't see it. Oh, down here? None. There are no hot bubbles down here. The whole clock. Oh, yes, here. I'm sorry, uh, were they, are they not registering? There are red yeah, points they, here, they here. They all seem my uh, that, that's my bad, bad choice of colors. It might be mixing the the red, blue, sorry. I should make those green in for future reference. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you now what we, actually, what we actually look at when we study the X-rays. So the nice thing about Chandra is that we're detecting individual photons. And so we do that because, we can do that because the, the rate of photons coming is so slow that pretty much we expose for three seconds and every 10 seconds, we get a photon, <laughs> believe it or not. And we do that, we build up exposures, we build up hour-long exposures that way uh, by doing that method. And so for each frame, we actually get one electron cloud distribution in the CCD, in the camera. And from that size of that cloud distribution, we can determine where the photons were coming from, and we can determine the energy that they had. And so because of, because of this power, we have a lot of, we have a lot of, extra analysis that we can do. So one of the things we can do is we can take all the photons we detected and we can look at them statistically. We can build a spectrum of them and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, and we can actually just ask questions of that list of photons 
uh, for instance, in this case, I'm asking the that list of photons, what is the median energy? What's the most frequently occurring energy in that distribution of photons? And I'm putting that down on this axis here. On this axis, I have the column density. This is how much material is between us and the nebula. And that's, that's important for x-rays because uh, most of that material is made of dust and that's perfectly matched to the size of the x-ray wavelengths. And so when there is material between us and the nebula, it'll get absorbed. The soft x-rays will actually be absorbed by that material and we won't detect them. And so that's an important, important uh, quantity to keep in mind. Uh, this, is, there's also, this is a proxy for extinction. So um, EB minus V or AV if you're familiar with extinction. Uh, on this plane, I'm showing you a bunch of models. These are plasma models. These are essentially just hot plasmas. Uh, astrophysical plasmas. It, this is the log temperature. So this is 1 million degrees and this is 10 million degrees. 3 million degrees is about, I mean, so, yeah, 3 million degrees is about here. I'm sorry, 5 million. <coughs> I can't do log in my head, but about 3 million degrees is about here. 6.5, log of 6.5. Um, <clears throat> And this is where our objects lie on this plane. Uh, so th these are the hot bubbles that I've been showing you in red. Um, I've color coded them by different characteristics of the central star. So the circles are pretty much just planetary nebula that are run of the mill, central stars that are run of the mill, meaning they don't have any abundance anomalies or they don't have any strange features to them. Uh, in squares, I'm showing you those objects that we call wolf rayet central stars. These are uh, bracket wolf rayet stars, they're not uh, wolf rayet stars are massive stars that have really intense winds. Uh, so by massive, I mean more than eight times the mass of our sun. We're not looking at stars like that in central stars of planetary nebula. We're talking mostly about stars that have masses from one to eight times the mass of our sun. But these wolf rayet stars are peculiar because they have bright <laughs> emission lines coming from the stars themselves. And that's because they're, they're driving these really dense winds into really dense material. And that creates these emission lines that we see. We see similar features in some of these central stars of planetary nebula. Those are those that are indicated by the squares there. Um, and they do tend to drive higher mass winds than the run of the middle central stars. When we study those wolf rayets, we find that more often than not, they are sources of diffuse X-ray emission. Again, indicating that 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 wind is really important to forming those hot bubbles. Uh, these are those compact cores I told you about, or those point sources. These are where the star itself is emitting. Again, I have them color coded here. These blue diamonds are known binary stars. And then these open circles are the run of the mill central stars or, or central stars that we don't have enough information to know if they're peculiar. And then we have the wolf rayet central stars here. The key takeaway is that everything you see in this diagram is emitting like a plasma. And, and so it's not emitting like a, like a photosphere. It's not emitting like, it's emitting like a plasma of gas. Altogether, I have them here. And now I'm gonna show you some more of these hot bubbles. Uh, mostly I'm gonna show you a few detailed views of this. This is BD plus 30, 36, 39. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image that I'm showing you. I'm gonna stand here. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope image looks like, the H-alpha image, just in grayscale, just to show you the details that you can see. Uh, the, nebula, well, the nebula itself is about five arc minutes, I'm sorry, five arc seconds in size. I'm going to stand here. Okay, I think this is a good spot. <laughs> so it's about five arc seconds across. There's the central star, there's the nebulosity around it. When we look at it in x-rays, this is what we see. Again, um, this doesn't look very impressive, but for x-rays, it's very difficult to focus x-rays. And so Chandra has the best spatial resolution of any x-ray mission we've ever launched. The resolution is about 0.3 arc seconds. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is the order of magnitude better than that, an order of magnitude better than that. But with x-rays, this is the best that we can do. If I make contours of that x-rays and put them onto the image, you can see clearly that the hot bubble is confined to within the nebular shell. And you even see some asymmetries in that nebula, in the x-ray distribution in that nebula. <clears throat> so 
because BD plus 30 is compact, we can actually get a grading spectroscopy. So Chandra also has gratings, which will let you disperse the light in, in the physical plane of the detectors so that you get a very high resolution uh, spectrum. And I'm showing you that real spectrum in the purple line here. So that's, actually, that's the real X-ray spectrum coming from this object. The black points that I'm showing you there is what we get from the CCD detector. When we take an image, remember I said we detect individual photons, so we can actually just pull out the energy characteristics of those individual photons. And that's what, that's what I'm showing you in the black here. It's lower resolution spectroscopy, but that's because the limitations of the, pro the two methods that we're using to extract the spectrum. Um, we took this black line here is coming from about 30 kiloseconds. The purple is coming from about 300 kiloseconds because you, you need to image deeper in order to get that high resolution spectrum to collect the photons. So what are we looking at in this, in this nebula here that I've been showing you? So this is a, a diagram showing you the density profile in, across, this is a central star over here. And then this is further away from the central star. The green line here is showing you the density of the material as you go away from the star. And then the blue line is showing you the temperature profile of that material. And so here you have a very high temperature, so millions of degrees, like I said, 10 million degrees and higher in this area. This is what we call the planetary nebula, um, which has densities of about 10 to the 3, 100 to 10 to the 3 um, particles per cubic centimeter. And it has temperatures of about 10 to the 4 Kelvin. That's the typical planetary nebula that we're used to studying, the ionized gas that we, we typically study, and that there, a lot of studies happen here on uh, gas. <coughs> this part here is the hot bubble that I've been showing you images of from BD plus 30 and other objects. This is that very hot gas, but very low density. In fact, if you were to make this into an image, you would not get this image here. You would not reproduce this. And it's mostly because this density is so low that we wouldn't detect it. The density is, is proportional to how many photons we're actually going to get from that, from that source. It's, it's proportional to the emission measure. And this density is so low that we wouldn't see these hot bubbles at all if this is what they look like. Uh, so what Stefan et al. and the Potsdam group did is they showed that if you turn on heat conduction, so, so if you turn on the, the interaction between these, this interface right here, <coughs> where you have this nebular material that has a lot of electrons, a lot of material, a lot of atoms, and this low density uh, plasma region here, if you let those two transfer heat between the two, which you should expect to happen, um, it's, it's a hot object next to a cool object. Uh, what you'll get is material from that nebula will be evaporated into that hot bubble. And as a result, you raise the density of the hot bubble and you lower the temp temperature of the hot bubble. And those two things conspire to get you the properties of what, what we actually observe in these, in these planetary nebula. Uh, only when you have stuff happening across that interface. Uh, this is using heat conduction to solve this problem. Um, Jesus uh, Tola has done similar simu calculations showing that actually uh, two-dimensionally you'll get structures that will actually mix that material as well uh, with or without heat conduction. It'll mix that interface and you'll do have the similar process happening. Again, so when you put these properties here, match the properties that we observed in the x-rays. The other uh, paradigm does not. You need to have this extra physics happening between these two interfaces. <clears throat> um, I didn't point out before, but I'll point out now, you'll see characteristic emission lines in, these, in this high resolution spectrum. What you don't see is iron. So this entire region here, you'll usually see a lot of iron emission if there is iron in that plasma, and we don't see it, which suggests that these hot bubbles are iron deficient. <clears throat> you'll see tons of carbon. This was quite unexpected when it was first uh, observed. And actually, when you actually 
study the, the plasma and you get the characteristics, you'll find that the C to O ratio is 30 times, uh, which is way more than we expect it to be. What we think is happening in this case is we're seeing evidence of the interaction between this 10 to the 4 nebular plasma and this 10 to the 6 gas. We think we're seeing um, ions crossing this contact discontinuity from this direction, crossing into there. And then they're there. when they reach that environment, there's a lot of electrons. And so they'll just collect, recombine, and you'll see this carbon emission, this carbon line. Uh, so like I told you, this is an image from Chandra. Every single pixel is a collection of photons. And so for every single pixel, I can, I can probe that pixel and ask it a question about that distribution of photons. And so what I've done is I've, I've developed a technique to do that actual probing and to get more information out of this image that I'm showing you. So what I'm asking this image here is I'm asking this photon, tell me what the median energy of your photons in your pixel are and give it back to me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna re reclassify your pixel as that value. And I can do this for the entire image and when I do that, I get this image here. So this is the median energy now, not the counts. Before we were looking at the counts. Now we're looking at the median energy of each of those pixels. So that, that quantity that I had on the lower axis to show you where all of these plasmas occupy. And so you'll see it looks distinctly different from the count <laughs> image. The green contours now are the median energy. And the image in the background are just the counts. And so you can see clearly they're, they're distinct from each other. It actually looks quite a bit like the nebula itself. And so you can see the median energy contours. So higher median energies are these islands and lower median energies are within here. You can see that they trace out the nebula much more nicely. And so what's actually happening here, so here's the image I've shown you, the median energy image. Median energy on this axis like before, column density here, and here are three different temperature plasmas going through this diagram. And the shaded region here is the distribution of the, of the median energies of the image. So you have a lot of low median energies and you have some high median energies. The high median energies are coming from the rim. And so if we knew what the plasma temperature of this plasma was, if we assume that the plasma temperature is constant throughout, then you might see, you might think that all the plasmas would lie on this line. All the median energies would be on this line. And if that's the case, then we have low median energies. We have low column densities. So we can take these median energies and translate them to column densities. We have low column densities here and we have high column densities here. And it suggests that across the nebula, the column density is increasing by a factor of three. So mm -hmm. any idea why is uh... The nebula is elliptical instead of spherical. This nebula itself, in general, uh, in general, in general, BD plus thirty is very is very interesting uh, because it looks it looks like it might actually be something that we're looking down into. So I showed you we had these bipolar shapes like this. Um, some people believe that this object itself might actually be like this. And we're looking straight into the pole, uh, and so its its shape and structure might be caused by the by these by this uh, by the projection, but the projection that we're looking at it in. Because the, the central star is really at the center. Yes, the central star is really at the center, and so it, that 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 buildup of nebular material might actually be uh, uh, like a like a donut or or torus around it. Um, so what, what my technique is showing us is that we can actually use the energetic information of the photons to actually see the effects of the nebula. And so what this ultimately means is that the nebula itself is absorbing the X-ray photons uh, from, from that inner plasma. Again, this is combining a bunch of observations to get 100 kiloseconds. This is 300 kiloseconds. That's a lot of time. This is, I think, 16 hours. No. It's longer than that. It's almost 30 hours, so it's longer than a day. Uh, this is about three days uh, to get this to, to get this information. It takes a lot of time. 
But in the future, if we launch this X-ray telescope, it'll actually go much faster, and I'll show you. This is the Lynx Observatory concept mission uh, for NASA. It'll have 50 times the sensitivity of Chandra. It'll have similar resolution, spatial resolution, but it'll maintain that spatial resolution across the entire field of view, which is gonna be amazing for being able to pick out sources from other sources and to tell if a source is extended or compact. Um, it's gonna have a suite of instruments and these are the main science drivers. If you have more questions, I refer you to this website um, here. But quickly, I wanna show you what, what, we would, what we would actually get for these type of objects. So I'm showing you here a spectrum of Chandra simulated uh, for 60 kiloseconds, a typical plasma temperature composition shown here. Uh, one kilosecond of links. So this is, this is 16 hours. This is 30 minutes. This is 30 minutes of exposure. And you start to see way more stuff. What, so much stuff. All of the photons that I use to create this, this plot here, this spectrum here has more photons than that entire plot in 30 minutes. So it's gonna be a real step, leap forward in X-ray studies of plasmas and other objects. Uh, if we did 10 kiloseconds, which is about, an, um, sorry, which is about two or three hours, which is about three hours, 2.77 hours, I think, uh, you would see actually structure in the lines, you'd see the continuum, you would see so much more than we can see now with the exposures that we have. So uh, I showed you the hot bubbles. I, I mentioned briefly the compact cores, but now I wanna spend some more time telling you about these compact cores because they're, they're quite interesting and unexpected as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, remember these compact cores are the blue points that I'm showing you here. So we see them at the later stages and at the very late stages of planetary nebula. Here's one in particular, the helix nebula, which I'm showing by this uh, hexagon point here. The central star is where we're seeing the x-rays. None of the rest of the nebula is emitting x-rays, just that central star itself. It's a compact source. This is what you would expect from the central star shown in gray. It's about 110 kilokelvin. This blue is showing you the actual x-ray emission that we detect. <laughs> So it's substantially larger, it's, it's in substantial excess, and the temperature when we fit that is 10 megakelvin. And we still don't know where this plasma is coming from in the helix nebula. I postulated that if you look um, at these binaries in diamonds here, these binaries are, are short common envelope binaries, post common envelope binaries. So they're stars that are orbiting each other less than a day. And the only way we know how to get those stars is if you go through a common envelope phase where the, the two stars appear to merge as one for a moment and then in their ev orbital evolution, they unbind and eject that envelope, that common envelope. And they for that common envelope goes on to become part of the planetary nebula. That's how you emerge from that, that, that um, potentially cataclysmic event. You emerge by ejecting that envelope and you have two stars that are really close together now and orbiting each other in periods less than a day. All of these diamond points are those type of stars, are those type of binary stars. They all have periods less than a day. And if we look at the energetics of the X-rays coming from them and we fit the plasmas, we see similar things to the Helix Nebula, a 10 million degree plasma. And the only way that we know how to explain that from that scenario is not the central star itself, but the companion to the central star. And so what happens when you enter into this common envelope is your companion is going to just accrete some of that common envelope material and it's gonna spin up. And as it spins up, it's gonna reignite its magnetic activity. And that magnetic activity will start to produce coronal emission. And we think what we're seeing in these objects here is the coronal emission coming from, from, that, central, from that companion to the central star. Similarly, these black points here are coming from these green points here. So this, these green points are, are the, these are composite objects. So they have both the diffuse emission and the compact emission. And if we isolate the compact emission, we get that they're also falling on this higher temperature uh, plane. So consistent with 10 megakelvin plasmas or consistent with uh, spun up companions. 
We don't know if these three here have companions. We suspect they do. We suspect the x-rays are telling us they do. Uh, but they're difficult to actually detect in these objects. This is the cat's eye nebula. Some people have suspected that it might be a double degenerate companion, which could either be two white dwarfs or a white dwarf brown dwarf. And that brown dwarf could be responsible for some of this uh, activity. <coughs> um, these are the wolf ray at central stars. So these are blowing these massive winds. And when we study the, the spectrum of those, the X-ray spectra of those, it seems to be consistent with the wind being variable. And so as a result, the wind is, is catching up to itself. And when it catches up to itself, it shocks really close to the surface of the star and it forms shocks. And it's very particular because these wolf ray at central stars have chemical types. They're subcategorized by whether they have a lot of carbon emission, oxygen emission, or nitrogen emission. What do you mean by variable? Decelerated as it, it's, it's what's happening is when the wind is being launched itself. The question was about um, what do I mean by variable winds? Uh, when it's being launched from the surface, it's coming off faster or slower, and then the faster will catch up. The faster will catch up with the slower wind, but it's happening really close to the surface, so we don't see an extended thing. We see a compact uh, source still. Um, so when we see a lot of carbon emission lines, we tend to find that the X-rays are have lower median energies. And if you remember from the plot, 0.3 keV is where that carbon emission line is coming from. And so we think that most of the photons in these sources are coming from shocked carbon material really close to the central star. Uh, this is where oxygen, oxygen's emission line is. And so this median energy is consistent for that purple square, is consistent. NGC 40, we only detect in, in diffuse emission. Okay. So it was, it, was up, it was up here in one of those okay. so things. We don't see the central star itself. Um, so these, this is consistent with this shock, shocked winds. And so we're, we're developing now a paradigm where those that are lower temperatures are coming from this self-shocking plasma, this, this wind that's variable and catching up with itself. And these that are high temperature are possibly coming from the spun up companions to these objects. <clears throat> Here they are all together. Uh, this is NGC 40 right there. It's one of the coolest ones that we've detected. Uh, it's, it's pretty expand, it's, it's expanded quite a bit. And so it's older. And so we think the temperature, we're seeing the temperature dropping off. And it's very faint. Um, we detected about 30 photons total coming from it. So I want to show you one more, I think, yep, one more image. Uh, this is NGC 7027. This is a very compact planetary nebula. It's a very, we think it has a massive progenitor. So we think the star that it's, that formed this object is about three to four solar masses. And I want to point out, this is the HST image. There's a star there. You'll see there's a evidence for a dust lane here, the shadowing that you see in the object. You see a little bit of this once symmetric mass loss. And then inside, you see this wildly asymmetric mass loss here and here. This is what it looks like uh, with just the H alpha filter. And this is what it looks like oops, in x rays. Doesn't look very impressive, <laughs> sure. But we do detect enough x rays to do some cool things with this object. First, notice it's asymmetric. Mir mirroring the asymmetry that you see here. But you'll notice there's a, a dearth of X-ray photons down here, and there's an abundance of X-ray photons up here. Uh, you can see that more clearly with when we look at the contours. So this is all of the X-ray emission contours in, X -ray in red shown onto the nebula. And you can see that dust lane here. And you see the, the lack or the reduction of X-ray photons here. Now we can, because we detect individual photons, I can make an image of just one group of photons and make an image of just another group of photons. It's one of the, cap one of the capabilities of X-ray astronomy is that you can do this um, filtering of, of, of photons. So here I'm showing you just the soft photons in this image. And here I'm showing you the harder photons, one to three keV. And the thing you'll notice is that the soft, the hard photons are more symmetric 
they fill the entire cavity that's forming in this nebula. There's a bright spot there, sure. But in the soft, you'll see the soft are confined to this region of the... Sorry, but is it possible that the, the soft X-rays were absorbed? Yes, the, <laughs> I'm, get, I'm going there. The, yes, okay. definitely. Definitely what, what is happening here. Um, so remember, there's this dust lane here, and I sh told you earlier that we got to worry about this column density because it absorbs the soft X-ray photons, and this is exactly what we're seeing in this object. So here is an extinction map made by looking at radio and optical emission of this nebula, doing a comparison and then figuring out what the extinction across that broad band of electromagnetic um, energy distribution is, is doing. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of extinction here corresponding to that dust lane. And then you, you see high extinction here. And then you see a low or a hole in the extinction here where photons are just going to be allowed to go through, pass unabsorbed. Similarly, in the optical image, you can see it's brighter here. Again, because we're not absorbing a lot of the photons. Now, when we put this, the hard X-ray photons, they occupy this region here. Remember, hard X-ray photons, they're susceptible to extinction but they're not as susceptible as the soft X-ray photons. Some of them will still get through. So we think here, we're being, they're being effectively blocked. So the, in reality, the X-ray plasma is probably distributed all throughout here, more or less evenly, but it's the, it's the overlying material that's absorbing that plasma and changing the aspects that we see. Here, is this, here are the soft X-ray photons confined more or less to that hole in the extinction. So allowed to go through past unabsorbed. There's probably soft X-ray photons all throughout this cavity, but we won't detect them because of this overlying extinction. Uh, we can actually separate the, the nebula now, but we can analyze this region alone and analyze this region by itself and analyze it all together. And that's what I'm showing here. This is the light green points is a low extinction region and its spectrum is shown here. You can see it's a little bit different. Uh, and then you have this high extinction region here in the dark green points. We can fit those separately, and we can get per, um, parameters for the plasma and that column density. And again, verify that that low extinction region is coming from low extinction plasma. That high extinction region is coming from a high extinction plasma. And it's more or less the same temperature. It's just being affected by that nebular material absorbing the x-rays. Uh, prior to trying to fit this object, we had a lot of difficulty because when you combine those two regions as one and you do a spectral analysis, it's trying to choose between these, these uh, column densities and it makes it more difficult to actually fit the model. <clears throat> so that's all of this. The main takeaway is that all of these X-ray sources are coming from plasmas, um, most of them. I'm going to show you one now that isn't. Uh, there's three likely origins for these. We have the hot bubbles, which I've shown you. We can resolve those and see that they're extended. Uh, they tell us more about the formation process, how those fast winds are interacting. Tell us about the physics between the interface of the nebula and the hot bubble and how it must be there in order to explain the observations. Um, some of these are coming from wind shocks, so these stars that are variable speeds and catching up with themselves really close to the surface. And then some are coming from binaries where, where the companion has been spun up and is emitting x-rays now. There's one object that does behave exactly like you would expect a central star to behave. And it's, oops, it's this one here. Uh, if I were to put black body curves on this diagram, on this plane, <laughs> there would be a bunch of vertical lines piled up right here. And that's where the dumbbell nebula is. The central star of the dumbbell is right here. And it's close enough to us that we can actually detect the photons. It's really faint. As if you move them further back, the nebula further back, we can't detect the photons because they're so faint in x-rays. Uh, I like to think that the dumbbell nebula didn't get the message that it shouldn't be doing this. So thank you for your attention. I, I'm going to leave up here this information. If you're interested in proposing for Chandra, talk to me afterwards. Our deadline is coming up in March uh, 14th, 2019. It helps to have a US collaborator because the US collaborator can get funding to support uh, the, the project. Um, and then also, if you want to learn more about links, uh, <coughs> go to this, this website here. You can subscribe for news and updates on that mission. Thank you.
questions? What can be said about dust? Is uh, dust being destroyed or is it being formed? <clears throat> and what's the, the mean time of uh, an iron dust? Uh, uh -huh. And what's the relation with the more extended planetary nebula phase at 10,000 degrees? Because you might produce all kinds of temperature variations and fluctuations going from the center outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good question, and one that we're actually starting to probe quite a bit. Um, so you know the abundance discrepancy factors um, that we see in planetary nebulae. So they look like there's inclusions of, of high, high, high of different abundances within the nebula itself. Um, when you correlate, when you look at those and you study those that have this diffuse X-ray emission, those the high the highest ADF values are the ones that have the hot bubbles, but they're also at that early phase. And so what's happening, whether the two are related or not, we know that the X-rays are being absorbed by the nebula. We, we, we can tell that by looking at the column densities, the image of BD plus 30, this object itself, we can tell that, that they are emitting this high energy photons. And that, that hasn't been accounted for uh, in, in those studies <laughs> yet. Um, and then as far as the dust itself, uh, this object itself, we have a really nice near infrared um, spectrum with the iGRINS instrument, which is a immersive grading. It gives you incredible um, um, spectral resolution and spatial as well. So we get some information. We put a long slit across this nebula this way, and we put one this way, and it looks like we're seeing an indication of uh, of essentially that the dust grain that is that has trapped the iron is the reason why we don't see the iron in the in the x-ray emission but also that it's driving outflows uh, in that dust somehow we don't fully understand it yet uh, but we are seeing some evidence that the dust is important in in, in it and the interrelationship between the x-rays and the dust are important how exactly we're still figuring it out What's up? How about, does, does this uh, x-ray absorption, will, is it warming up the dust? Is it, does it show preferentially and what's happening with that uh, in infrared emission? I mean, warming up the dust itself, um, it's changing some of the ionization, whether or not it's actually impacting the temperature of it is another question, but it is changing the ionization. So we'll, we'll see, so iron two and iron three, uh, which when we don't expect iron three, we might see it because because the X-ray the energetics of the X-ray photons can possibly bump up inner shell electrons to a higher state than you would get from the UV radiation field. So that's one way we might see it. I don't know if that's heating up the dust, <laughs> but it is it is knocking out inner electrons to a higher state. That's one way that it can affect it. Um, it depends on where the dust is with respect to the nebula and the hot plasma, um, if it's around it. Uh, right now, we think that the, based on this observation, based on this uh, extinction map, we think that the dust is outside of the optical nebula, and so it's not necessarily going to. I mean, what do you mean outside of the optical nebula? So, what do you think? Dust at, well, actually, for in front of the nebula, but for this, actually, for this phase, that's not that's not true, <laughs> because this is such an early and compact phase that you're still going to have dust uh, close to the hot plasma. And so that 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 could definitely transfer some heat to that dust. How we would how we would see that signature, I'm not sure yet. Another question: What about the chant plan? Uh, is it program? Is it will it be finished? Will, will so uh, so the problem is is that um, with chant plans, we need because what's happening in the Chandra is that uh, since it launched, um, material has been accumulating on the window that the detectors are behind. And so that's contributed some un unexpected uh, foreground extinction of some soft photons. Uh, we can still detect soft photons, but we don't detect them with the efficiency we used to. And so we have to observe longer in order to get the photons of, from these objects. And so it's gotten to the point where it's prohibitively expensive to do one of these observations of planetary nebula now. 
So Chan plan is essentially finished. That's what you're saying. We we probably won't have any more new observations, yes. but we're still analyzing the observations that we do have. Um, there is a possibility that Chandra might do a bake out, which would heat that that window to ablate the material off of it. Uh, if that happens, then we re re recover the sensitivity and we would go after more objects. But we've actually pretty much done uh, most of the objects that we're really interested in. <laughs> We've already done. Yeah, the, the small ones. The small ones, right. Let me show you that. So we've pretty much done all of these compact objects yeah, that we're interested in. Here's, here's all of the nebula, and then the, shade, the filled in ones <coughs> are the ones that we've studied. And so we're pretty good, complete out to this, okay. Okay. out to some radius. And that's where the most interesting things are happening, we think. Um, out here, I think our detection fraction will drop substantially. Uh, so whether or not it's worth going after those is, is hard to tell. But it is definitely worth getting more photons on some of these. But that's prohibitively expensive right now. More questions? You're hypothesizing that the source of the compact, uh, the compact emission has to do with binarity. Right? Some of them. So would you expect some correlation between uh, those sources to be uh, the, nebula, the nebular morphology would be different perhaps? Yes, there is known, it's, it's already been shown that the compact post common envelope binaries have distinct morphologies and, and density profiles in the nebula than those that are not post common envelope binaries. Uh, definitely, definitely because our, our, those are post common envelope binaries but we don't have all of the post common envelope binaries studied. Some of them are too far away for us to detect. But the ones that we have seen, yes, we see, we see, we see that they are amongst the categories of those with distinct morphologies. More questions? Uh, if not, let's thank again, Trudy. Thank you. And we have I, I just parts. want to say uh, that Fred, uh, Rudy is going to be here for three days, and that we are his. He welcome any conversation, question, or comments that you will have. In Thank which you. office? Two eleven. Two eleven. Okay. Okay.